in his talk, were great collaborators, but I tried to list most of them here. Um, and thanks also to Brandon, one for a very, very good talk, but uh, it also one that turned out to be a great introduction to many of the things I try, I want to say here. So um, I'm going to have two minor quibbles with Brandon about it. Um, as you see on the left side here, um, as Brandon was talking about, we think that uh, polarization from the dust is due to align dust grains with their long axis uh, um, uh, uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, which then gives rise to both dichroic extinction polarization and emission polarization. But the question, of course, here is why is that? And as Brandon pointed out, and I'll try to make uh, uh, st stronger, is that not only do we really need to understand the mechanism behind this alignment to understand the magnetic field along the line of sight, but if we really do understand it, uh, we can then start using the polarization to also probe uh, other parameters of the dust and the magnetic and the install medium. So my first minor quibble with, with Brandon is going to be that I don't think the dust and the polarization are well uh, correlated. As he also showed in his slide, the upper envelope is well correlated. But this wedge we see here is more or less uh, what my talk is about. Why is it that not all the sight lines produce equally good polarization? So there's been um, two uh, uh, paradigms. There are a few other mechanisms as well, but two paradigms proposed for why it is that we get green alignment in, in the install medium. Um, the long-standing and still in many cases textbook version uh, is paramagnetic relaxation alignment, or which we uh, all know and love as Davis Greenstein alignment. Um, and I will uh, spend a slide on showing why that doesn't work. Um, and this is my second minor quibble with Brandon, is that David Greenstein didn't get it basically right. They got it wrong. Um, where they did get it right is that the predicted alignment orientation is the same as we see, but otherwise David Greenstein is, is not right. Um, so in, in, instead, and um, based on a number of challenges that happened in the 80s and 90s uh, and early 2000s, um, the radiative alignment torque theory was developed uh, by people like Bruce Drain, uh, uh, Alex Azarian, um, uh, Dwayne Roberge, and their collaborators. Um, and it's been tested since. And I think my bottom line here is I think it's safe to say that rat alignment is now established as the right paradigm or something very, very close to rat alignment. There are still a number of challenges left, and we'll get to that. Um, but uh, red line per se, I think, is safe to say um, that it is the correct model uh, for alignment. So since this meeting has the word past in its title, I wanted to spend one slide on uh, discussing why it is that we uh, think that Davis Greenstein is not uh, the right mechanism for what it causes against the alignment. So Davis Greenstein is a beautiful theory and it's really full of a lots of very intriguing and intrinsic uh, and intricate physics and mathematics. Um, and uh, one of the things that drove uh, observers nuts um, uh, was that it had enough uh, parameters in it to wiggle room um, that it was really hard to disprove. But the fundamental um, prediction that has to hold, or the fundamental condition that has to hold for Davis Greenstein to work is something that Jones and Spitzer pointed out already in 1967, which is that when the gas and dust temperature equil equilibrate, the alignment must go away. Um, so already in 1984, uh, Terry Jones showed, put this into doubt. So here's a map of the a core of the sudden coal sack in H-band polarization. Um, and he also measured the CO1 to zero as a probe of gas temperature and the 135 micron uh, emission using the KAO uh, as a temperature probe. And what you can see here is that in the core region, in the region labeled D, the polarization orientation shifts dramatically from the surrounding cloud 
So we are seeing alignment in the core at extinctions of the order of 10 to 15 magnitudes. Um, but, and, and what Terry showed from his one band each of far infrared and CO is that the temperature in the core of the cloud in gas and dust are probably the same. Now, of course, single band far infrared and single transition CO are not really very strong cases for what the temperature is, but I want to give Terry credit for having uh, pointed this out already as, as long ago as this. What um, ultimately um, showed that there was something wrong uh, in, in the interpretation was the uh, uh, observations that Brandon talked about, Jim Huff's observations of COIs um, uh, in, in the core or in the deep parts of the Taurus cloud, um, where you can probe only the dense dark gas by looking at the CO ice line. As uh, Doug Witt and his collaborator have shown down here on the left, the CO ice only survives once you get into about seven magnitudes of extinction and the fraction in the solid phase goes up. So the typical uh, extinction you're looking at is probably something like 10 magnitudes. So, and of course, by then, all the external heating sources have gone away. So it's very likely that you're seeing um, uh, uh, material that where the dust and the gas have the same temperature. And as Brandon showed, we do still see polarization in that, uh, in that deep uh, uh, line, um, which makes it very hard to explain by baby screens. Um, Bruce Strain and Alex Azarian also have some very interesting and, and important theoretical arguments that shows that if the dust grains have an internal temperature, they're basically unalignable by mechanisms that are centered in the dust grain itself. Um, of course, Davis Greens, as I said, is very flexible. And one of the arguments that was uh, made for making it stronger is to include more higher magnetic susceptibility in the dust grains, so-called super paramagnetic grains. Uh, I'll get back to that at the end of my talk, but uh, for the David Greenstein mechanism, um, there was a paper by um, uh, Roshkinikov et al. Uh, about 10 years ago now that probed the that aspect. And what they did was they looked at depletion patterns and polarization in a fairly large sample of stars. And what they, then, what they did to probe for super paramagnetic dust grains is that they took the depletions in silicon, magnesium, and iron, and they um, said, okay, let's remove all the silicon into dust grains with the stoichiometry of, of olivine, which is a normal paramagnetic silicate, and then ask, is there any iron left in the solid fix? Uh, because that iron is likely to be in some kind of ferromagnetic uh, state. And if they do that and plot the polarization efficiency as a function of that uh, remaining uh, uh, iron solids, they see absolutely nothing. Okay, so Davis Greenstein is probably not the mechanism to go. And as I said, based on, on, on a number of those experiments and theoretical arguments, um, Lazarian, Drain, Wayne, Roberge, etc., cetera, um, um, developed an idea by Dolkina from Mitropanov that helical dust grains can be spun up by the uh, uh, circular, compo circular polarization components of, uh, of the light that shines on them. And so down here on the right is a figure from Drain and Weingartner, I think 1997, I think. Um, where they showed numeric letters would work. <coughs> and Lazarian and Huang in 2007 um, uh, uh, generalized that into an analytical model and showed that this is indeed uh, viable in the ISM. So what goes on here is that the radiation field imparts a torque onto the grain uh, if it's helical, which spins the grain up. If the grain is paramagnetic, which is an important aspect here, um, then the Barnett effect will uh, magnetize the grain and that magnetization in turn interacts with the external field 
and gives the polarization and the alignment we see. Um, the uh, spinning up of dust grain has been uh, supported and verified in the lab. Um, the Barnett effect is the inverse of the Einstein de Haas effect, which is a well known solid state effect in the lab. So, theoretically and numerically, this all works. Uh, and does it work in the ISM? Um, so, I don't have time to go through um, the, uh, all of the tests that's been done. So, I'm going to focus just on, on the first one, which is if the grain alignment is driven by the radiation field, then the efficiency should be depending on the field strength. And that's been tested by a number of, of methods in a number of regions. And I'm going to start here with a plot from uh, Witsen et al. 2008, where they probed the polarization efficiency in the Taurus molecular cloud. And they used both true background stars and also stars that are embedded in the cloud. And what you can see here is the slope of the polarization efficiency as a function of AD, which we interpret as being due to turbulence along the line of sight. And you can see that for some of the embedded stars, which are the red points, follow the ones from the true background stars. But for some of them, they are significantly more aligned, better polarization um, than you get from those earlier ones in the background stars. And the interpretation here is that for those stars, the, get, the dust is close enough to the star that the star doesn't act only as a background light source, it's also close enough that it enhances the alignment. So Ilya Medan and I did a uh, somewhat similar but with a different technique measurement a couple of years ago, where we used a big survey of polarization by Andrew Berdyugin to probe the alignment efficiency in the shell and the uh, wall of the local bubble. So the local bubble has been well mapped um, and we know where it is, we know its structure, and we also know where the uh, stars are surrounding it. So what we did was we, for each region of the local bubble wall, we looked at the alignment efficiency for polarization efficiency, and we integrated the light starlight from the surrounding OB associations. And what we find is that the alignment efficiency, which is shown as the data points here, are indeed very well correlated with the uh, intensity of the blue light um, in, in, from the surrounding stars. Um, this also works uh, at higher uh, intensities, but I'm going to let Archana talk about that next. The uh, same correlation with intensity also is found in the far infrared. Uh, here's a plot from Sophia Hawke data by Santos et al. And they also see that the alignment efficiency goes up with temperature and down with higher column density, which is a, a, in, in accordance with what Brandon was showing you before, that it looks like the alignment efficiency drops as you go into the clouds. So uh, this is the only experimental test I have time for right now, but I just wanted to show a long list saying uh, and showing that we have um, done a number of tests on rat. And rat theory has the wonderful aspect for at least for an observer that it sticks out its neck and, 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 and offers or challenges us to disprove it. It has a number of very specific predictions that could have been proven wrong, but so far they haven't. Um, and uh, so I think that again, this is fairly well established. And that's the triumph of my talk title, which is that because of the development of the theory and the testing of it, we now have in rat alignment a well understood quantitative theoretical paradigm under which we can interpret in stellar grain alignment. So the remaining challenges, I'm just going to mention a few, um, uh, but we still need to, to address. Um, the radiation field strength and color, it depends on the color. And there are a number of issues. It's the, the uh, radiation, uh, sorry, the, the alignment holes, the polarization holes that Brandon mentioned, but I'm gonna go in the other direction for this talk and talk about the UV. Um, so the UV is a very poorly explored 
region for uh, in stellar medium polarimetry. There's only been about 28 stars or 28 sight lines that have been probed with the two uh, Whoopi and uh, with the Whoopi satellite uh, payload on the on the space shuttle and the FOS on HST. Um, so in most of those sight lines, the UV is rather boring. Um, so if you take a Tsiolkovsky curve fitted from near infrared and optical data, and you extend it into the UV, um, it just follows, the UV follows what you would expect from uh, optic. However, in seven of the sight lines, what you see is a significant excess in the UV polarization. And this super Tsiolkovsky polarization um, is thought to be or could be due to the presence of sublimen limit radiation. Because remember, the rat condition is that grains will be aligned if they're exposed to wavelengths less than the grain diameter. So if you can shift down the radiation field color beyond the alignment limit, you can align the smaller grains. And what's intriguing here is that most of these seven sight lines are behind the per OB3 uh, super bubble, as I'm showing here on the left, which argues that what may be going on is that the, the material in that super bubble is fully ionized and therefore we have uh, EUV radiation. And that could be a way to probe that EUV radiation. Um, one thing I wanna just mention is in the far infrared, um, we uh, earlier, as John Valancourt showed in 2008, uh, expected to see a very con cave uh, spectrum of the far infrared polarization efficiency. And this was modeled by Drain and Frazee uh, as due to a, a combination of a, an aligned population silicates and an unaligned hotter carbon population. However, more recent data from BLASTPOLE and from Planck don't seem to see this. And I think this is one of the challenges we need to understand whether this is grain alignment or environment or etc. We also need to understand the other aspects of the grain dynamics, including collisional damping, IR damping, uh, destructive rats, etc. And I think Achana is going to mention a little bit about this uh, the collision damping as well. So I want to focus on grain uh, mineralogy a bit now. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, both the internal and external alignment of the, dust, of the grains that are required to show polarization um, actually require paramagnetic materials. And this is fine for silicates because they are paramagnetic, but carbon grains are diamagnetic. So what's going on with them? Um, to test that, we um, uh, identified the only place I can think of where you, I get pure carbon grains. So we measured the polarization uh, of the IRC 10 to 1 6 circumstellar envelope with Hawk Plus on Sophia. And we see a fully um, radial polarization pattern. In other words, where the grain's long axis is oriented in the direction of, radi of the radial direction, which is quite surprising. To follow up and better understand what's going on here, um, we uh, did polarization, optical polarization of background stars in, in, in the envelope um, using uh, 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 anti bell Eugen and Bill dipole 2. Uh, and what we can see here is in the optical, the polarization orientation is purely azimuthal, which is, of course, consistent with the uh, Hawk data. And I will note that these stars are far enough away from the central star that this is dichroic extinction. Not only are we doing a correct scat subtraction, but we but they're far enough away that the, that the scattering is very, very low. So what we're seeing here is a radial um, uh, alignment of the grains with a long axis. Um, as we can see on the lower on the left here, the polarization fraction is very low. This is the, the opposite of what Gina is seeing. Um, and, and what we think is going on here, 
and as shown by um, um, Tian Huang and, and, and Alex Nasserian in 2009, this is probably a second order K-rat alignment of dust grains without internal uh, relaxation and therefore internal alignment. Five more minutes. Thank you. So the other aspect of carbon or think carbon um, is the 2175 Ongstrom extinction feature in the UV. So we know from uh, extinction measurements that the extinction curve goes up very steeply into the blue. Um, and at 27, 2175 Ongstroms, there is a um, feature that is uh, unidentified the carrier so far. We think from uh, abundance arguments uh, and, 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 uh, and the size and the shape of the, the feature that it's likely um, some kind of small <coughs> carbon-based grains that's, that's causing this. But as I told you, only seven out of the 28 sight lines that we know of in UV shows um, super Sarkovsky polarization. Only two of them show uh, polarization in this feature. So some do, um, it's, a, it's not zero, but very few do. So what on earth is going on here? Um, and two is too small a number even for an astronomer to make statistics of. But I'll just note that both of these probe uh, star forming region. Now, if the uh, extinction bump is carbonous and it's small grains, maybe it's related to PAHs. Um, and so there was a paper a few years ago by uh, Chang et al that uh, probed the 11.3 micron pH feature in the cluster uh, into the material surrounding the MWC about 1080 cluster. And they see a strong feature. Um, uh, so that's good. I would, uh, I'm still a little bit worried, but if you look at the lowest panel on the left, the position angle rotates quite a bit there. Um, so we need more data on this. So we need more data, both in the mid infrared on the pHs, but we specifically and especially need more UV data um, uh, which there is efforts to do. And I think Paul Scohan is going to talk about Polestar tomorrow. So I'll leave that to him. Um, the final thing I want to touch on is um, what Brandon already talked about a bit about um, Gina's result that show very high polarization fraction uh, in, in regions where Planck also, of course, showed very high polarization fraction. And so the, 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 the issue of superparamagnetic inclusions um, have been raised again, theoretically, to maybe explain this. And I think this is a very important uh, area to probe. I'm not going to say anything more than to say that, uh, one, um, the uh, evidence from Boschkinikov et al. seem to not support uh, superparamagnetic uh, uh, material significant levels and correlation with the, with the dust efficient, uh, polarization efficiency. And the other thing is that we do see um, enhancement of the polarization efficiency by other torques such as molecular hydrogen formation, which we did a few years ago. And so if the grains are super paramagnetic, they tend to, in many models, uh, thus area and private communication, to saturate very quickly. And so therefore, no other mechanism would have an effect. So I think this is one of those things we really should be addressing in the next, um, in upcoming years here. And I think one of the ways we might do that is to follow um, the, the technique that uh, John Mathis outlined in, in 1986 for explaining the Sarkovsky curve under uh, Davis Greenstein alignment. So I think I'm starting to run out of time, probably it might already be. Um, so I'm going to mostly just leave my summary up and say that I think the good news for us is that rat alignment is now well enough established as a paradigm that we can use it to study the interstellar medium, both magnetic fields and other characteristics. And I think that the, the key 
going forward in the future of the conference title is to combine the optical near infrared polarization and hopefully UV with the far infrared and submillimeter wave data. But I would also put in a very strong case for doing high quality spectral polarimetry in both wavelengths to domains. And I'll stop there and see if there's any question, any time left for questions. Thank you very much.